Hey, Livingstone. Thanks for tuning in to worship with us today. Please keep praying for our church council as we move toward reopening our church. We're continuing to take a bit of a wait and see approach as things reopen, and we'll continue to communicate with you all via our website, livingstonebaptist.org, and our Facebook page when we have a firm reopening date. Our adult Bible study on Zoom was canceled last Tuesday due to the electrical outage from the storms, but we do plan to meet this Tuesday for a short session of Bible study and fellowship. We meet at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. And if you haven't given this a try yet, I want to encourage you to choose the time that works best for you and join us on Zoom this Tuesday. Our K-5th through grade team kids will continue to meet this Wednesday on 6.30 on Facebook Live, and our 6th through 12th grade youth will meet at 7.30 on Zoom. Finally, I'm thankful for how you all have continued to give toward the ministry of our church during this time. We've set up online giving at livingstonebaptist.org slash give. You can also mail your gift to our church at P.O. Box 378, Portageville, Missouri. Or you can contact our treasurer, Julie Boyd, and drop off your offering to her. Let's pray as we begin our worship time. Father, we thank you again for the privilege that we have, even in these unusual circumstances, to be able to stay connected and worship online. Father, we pray that uh, as we uh, hear your word preached today, as we sing songs of praise, as we honor our mothers a little bit this morning, that Lord, you would just be lifted up and, and glorified through it all. And Lord, we do want to continue to pray for those who are impacted by the storms that came through our area this week. And I know many suffered uh, property damage and things like that. And, and we just pray that you would just continue to to provide in, in the recovery effort after that. And we thank you for the folks that are, uh, that, that are working to, to help uh, to take care of needs during this time. Father, we pray for folks in our, our church family who uh, are, are facing different needs in these past few days. I know we've got some folks that uh, have had some uh, doctor's appointments and uh, Miss Juanita Riddle recovering from surgery and things like that. And we just pray that you would continue to provide uh, for those folks as well. And again, we just ask that you would be honored and glorified through our time uh, here today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I hope you'll join in singing this first song as an act of worship to the Lord.
love singing that song on Mother's Day for a couple of reasons. One, young kids enjoy it. Two, it's a song that my mom sang to us growing up, and maybe yours did too. And finally, I love those additional verses added by Zach Hicks a few years back. That one that says, sin might lead or farthest hill, but Jesus' grace goes farther still. We've all needed to remember that at some point. For our missions moment today, we're going to West Africa, to the nation of Ghana, where Alan and Beth Locke serve as our IMB missionaries. There are actually a lot of Christian churches in Ghana. The problem is that many are doctrinally way off course. Many teach prosperity theology, the idea that you should follow Jesus to, as a way to become wealthy. Others never preach or teach the scriptures at all. And so much of the Locke's ministry is focused on leading these churches back to the Bible and to discipling people in God's word. Let's pray that Alan and Beth's leadership would make a lasting impact in this nation of 30 million people. And let's pray that the Ghanaian church would be awakened to true gospel faith and would lead others to find their hope in Christ, not material riches. Let's pray together. Father, we pray for Alan and Beth Locke for their ministry there in the nation of Ghana. We thank you for um, other uh, missionaries and Christian workers over the years uh, and even leadership there in that country that has uh, planted new churches. And Father, some of these churches have lost their way. We pray that, that folks like the Locks and, and would be able to, to come alongside and point people back to the truth of your word and, 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 and what the purpose of the church is and what good gospel ministry looks like. And Father, we just pray you'd raise up a reform movement of, of leaders in the churches there in that country that would win people back to Christ. Christ alone. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, it is Mother's Day, a day when we celebrate moms in our country and all that their love and influence has meant to us. Ordinarily on this day, our kids might be making some cute craft to take home to mom, but circumstances this year led us to do something different. We asked kids in our church to honor their mom by sending in a video. Check it out. I love about my mom is that she works really hard and she keeps us fed. I love my mom taking about me. One thing I love about my mom is that no matter how hard I try or how down I get on myself, she's always pushing me to be my best and be better than others. One reason I love my mom is that she's always there for me. She pushes me to do the best I can. One thing I love about my mom is everything because she is the greatest. One thing I love about mom kisses. One thing I love about mom is when she cooks breakfast. One thing I love about my mom, she does everything to make me happy. One thing that I love about my mom is her constant support through everything that I do. Hey, Cal, what do you love about mom? That she has been helping me with my homework for the last month and a half. How about you, Casey? That she has the patience with me. One thing I love about my mom is her beautiful smile. One thing I love about my mom is how she cares for us. I love my mom because she always motivates me to do the best of my abilities, and she's always there for me and my brother. My favorite thing about mommy is whenever she gives me candy. She always has my back. She's always there for me when I need her. She loves me no matter what. We I love you, mom. The one thing I love about my mom is that she's always a hard worker. One thing I love about my mom is that she cares for us. And she puts others before herself. One thing I love about my mom is... She does things for me. First of all, though, she takes a bath. One thing I love about my mom is that she always knows what to do and when to do it. Always. Always prepared. One thing I love about my mom is that no matter what happens, or no matter what life does to her, she bounces back with a smile. One thing I love about my mom is her cooking. One thing I love about mom is how accepting she is. The one thing I love about my mom is that she is caring and she is very nice. One thing I love about my mom is her kind and loving heart. 
One thing I like about my mom is that um, she goes back riding with me. I love you, Mom. 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 We love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for everything, Mom. I love you. I love you, Mommy. Love you, Mom. We love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. We love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. We love you, Mommy. That video was a lot of fun to put together. And if I missed your child, I apologize. I tried to make contact with every child that I could while keeping it a surprise for our moms. If I missed someone or missed a text or a video clip that you sent in, I'm very sorry and I hope that you'll forgive me. I once heard a story about an elementary school teacher who had taught her students a science lesson on magnets. And so on the quiz, she asked this question. My full name has six letters. The first one is M. I pick up things. What am I? And she was surprised when she went to grade the test that half of her class had answered, Mother. <laughs> Moms just don't have the exhausting job of picking up after their kids. They also undertake the noble task of picking us up through life with their love, their faith, and their encouragement. Let's pray for them now. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to celebrate our mothers and all that they mean to us. And Lord, I know for many of us, this is a day to, to celebrate and to honor mom and to the consistent example of love and faith that she has been to us over the years. I know for the others, this may be a, a bittersweet day. It may be a, a day where they're grieving a, a mother who's already gone on uh, to be with you in heaven. Father, it may be a day where, where others are, are grieving the, the pain of infertility or the loss of a child. And so we pray for your comfort and peace to be with them. Father, we know that um, uh, perhaps for some, uh, this is a, a day in which it's just bittersweet because their, their mom was never uh, the, the, the person who really showed uh, the right kind of example of love and care for them. But Father, we thank you that, that even in that we can look to your word and see that moms and dads were only ever meant uh, to, to be uh, just uh, an example of what your unchanging, constant love for us is like. And even when others fail us, we have a God who, is, who draws near to us, who is a friend that sticks closer uh, than a brother or a mother. And we can look to you and rest in your care and love for us. And so, Father, we pray that in each and every circumstance that folks are facing today, that you would come alongside and draw near to them. And we thank you uh, for those moms that we can celebrate today and all that they've meant to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Since we can't meet face to face, we've been talking with one church member each week and learning more about their story of faith. But this week for Mother's Day, I decided to go a different direction. I interviewed my mom, Marcia Higgs. She's been a spiritual role model for me over the years, and I thought that her perspective might strengthen and encourage moms in our church too. Take a look. All right, Mom, thank you for doing this today. Um, most people here probably don't know how much this is out of your comfort zone, but I appreciate you doing it. This is true love for your son right here. It uh, is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've been asking people at our church, like, what's one thing about yourself that a lot of people wouldn't know? Um, of course, there's a lot of things about you people at our church wouldn't know, but one thing I was thinking about, I don't know that I've really, I don't know that I've really ever asked you where you went to church growing up. I mean, I know you grew up in Barbell, Kentucky and Corinth, Mississippi, but where did you guys go to church growing up? Well, <clears throat> we moved from Barbell when I started school. And so um, in Corinth, Mississippi, we went to First Baptist Church there and that's where we went the whole time until we moved here to Barton when I graduated high school. Okay. Um, 
How many children do you have? It's Mother's Day. Okay. Well, I have one son and three daughters, but one of those daughters has been in heaven since she was eight months old. Okay. So she's living the good life. Okay. Well, which one of those is your favorite child? Um, <laughs> I don't have a favorite. We know your they're favorite all, son. We know your favorite son unique. is. That's all that matters. They are all unique in their own way. <laughs> Mom, uh, do you have a favorite Christian song or hymn that's meant a lot to you over the years? Um, great is the faithfulness has always been a favorite hymn of mine. Okay. Uh, probably because one of my favorite verses has to do with that hymn, but it just talks about, you know, morning by morning, new mercies I see, you know, all I've needed, the hand hath provided, you know, great is thy faithfulness. And so God is just faithful all the time. Um, there is like a song. I've only heard it a couple of times, but I think sometimes God just has you hear things when you need it. And uh, back in 86, the choir sang this song, When Answers Aren't Enough. And I was just, you know, dealing through, going through a hard time then. And when I heard that song, you know, I'm not a very emotional person, but I just had to fight back tears because it said, when answers aren't enough, there's Jesus. He is more than just an answer to your prayer. And your heart will find a safe and peaceful refuge when answers aren't enough, he is there. And it just went on, and that song just touched me so much. And in fact, part of the words of that song are on Allison's uh, tombstone, yeah. because that was during that time. But I've only heard it one other time, and the whole song just, you know, yeah. really speaks to people that are going through a difficult time. I'm sure if people want to know the whole song, they can Google it. But yeah. <clears throat> those are probably my two favorite. <clears throat> Do you have a favorite Bible verse, Mom, or one that's meant a lot to you? Well, um, my favorite is Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are all the called according to his purpose. And not all things are good that happen to us, but God works them for our good. And a lot of times we can't see his big picture. We don't know how he's working them for our good, but he is. Mom, real quickly, just share a quick testimony of when you were saved. <clears throat> okay, I'll try to make it quick. <laughs> you may have to put your sermon short today. Okay. Now, um, I was raised in a Christian home, and I was involved, you know, in all the programs at church, and I was basically a good kid. I didn't give my parents a lot of trouble, and we went to church every week, taught about, you know, got at home, and when I was in elementary school, I was baptized at First Baptist Church in Corinth. And then when my family moved here to Martin, we moved our church letter to First Baptist here. But in, um, and that was back in like 1972 or 73. Well, in August of 84, our church was getting ready to have a revival. And the Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday night service before that Sunday, Brother Tom had a testimony time. And at first he asked for volunteers to give their testimony. But then, he called on, I'll never forget this, he called on Virginia Wells by name to give her testimony. That's probably about the closest I've come to having a panic attack because I began to panic thinking, what am I gonna say if he calls on me? I mean, it's Wednesday night, there's not many people here. He knows my name, you know, what am I gonna say? And I couldn't tell you a word Miss Virginia said because the whole time I'm just thinking, you know, what am I gonna do? And I kept thinking back to the time, you know, I went for it as a kid and just started to really doubt if I was really a Christian. Mm -hmm. And then, of all things, they give an invitation on Wednesday night. Brother Tom never gives an invitation on Wednesday night. Well, I, I wanted to go down front. Something inside was telling me, which I know was the Holy Spirit. But I just started thinking, well, I can't go down front. I mean, I'm 29 years old. I'm married. I've got two kids, you know. I've yeah. taught Sunday school. You know, I've worked with kids. You know, what are people going to think? So I didn't. And so, but the rest of that week, I was just preoccupied with that struggle of whether I was really saved or not. I didn't talk to anybody about it because I knew I needed to decide for myself. And at that age, people, you know, if you ask them about it, they'll say, well, you know, you grew up in church. You go to church all the week. You know, you, you teach this and you teach that. You know, you're a good person. You know, if anybody's a Christian, you are. 
-hmm. and that's not what I needed to hear. Uh, but that Saturday, um, that same week, I got you and uh, Kimberly both down for a nap at the same time, and your dad was at work. So I just started reading my Bible, all those verses that I already knew that talked about salvation, and God just spoke to me through his word that even a good church person is lost without Jesus, and they're going to spend eternity apart from him. And I just realized that I'd had all this head knowledge my whole life, but I'd never really prayed and repented of my sins and asked for forgiveness and asked Jesus to save me. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did um, that afternoon. Sorry. Yeah. It's, you know, there's times you just never forget. And um, a sense of relief and peace just came over me at that moment. Well, that Sunday the revival started. And so I just prayed all during that service, give me the courage to go down front because, you know, it's very humbling as an adult, especially when you've grown up in church to admit, you know, I've never had a personal relationship with Jesus this whole time. Yeah. But the invitation that day was I surrender all. And that's what I did and went down front and I was baptized next week. Awesome. So for you, that was as an adult, you kind of understood I've kind of been in this Christian culture all my life, but I've never really personally had a relationship with Jesus. Right, right. You know. Mom, besides the Bible, is there a book or a piece of parenting advice that you leaned on when you were raising us? Well, I work full time, so I didn't have a lot of time to read much besides the Bible. I did read The Strong-Willed Child by James Dobson a couple I times. I think you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, was not for me, right? That. I'm just kidding. Oh, I'd recommend that book for anybody. I really love the Home Life magazines, you know, that you would get uh, at church, you know, because they had a lot of good articles in them. Um, and I, you know, we had a lot of, you know, a good pastor, you know, Dr. Um was really good about having sermons about families and advice and everything. And, think just you know pray for your kids every day you know pray that when they're old enough to understand you know what Jesus did for them and to understand about sin and repentance that they do you know they do accept Jesus and I think um, you can be a better mom if you keep your relationship with God the most important thing in your life because you're you know your kids are always watching you to see how you treat others how your faith and trust in God helps you handle up and down you know, the ups and downs of life, you know, somebody did tell me, you know, that my kids were going to have a lot of friends along the way, but I was the only mom that they would have, and so, you know, when your kids are little, you know how it is, they think you know everything, you know, you can do anything, but your kids are not always going to like you, especially when they hit middle, high, and high school, but you've got to be their mom, you can't be their friend, you know, you've got, you know, make sure they're in church, and Sometimes you have, you have to make them do things that they don't want to do. Yeah. Like go to choir. I mean, you hated choir. Brother Elwood knew you hated choir. But he said, Marsha, you just, just keep sending them. He said, you know, I said, you let me know, you know, if he gets acting so bad, you know, we'll take care of it. But then, you know, you finally turn the corner and then you didn't mind going to choir. But sometimes you just have to make kids do stuff they don't want to do. Sometimes you have to say no to things you know, that you know is not good for them. Yeah. But I have found out that when they get to be an adult, lots of times they'll come back around and they'll realize that you actually did know a little bit more than they thought. And they'll thank you for caring enough about them, you know, to do some of the things you do, for not letting them do some of the things they wanted to do, you yeah. know. And, um, you know, somebody told me your goal as a parent is not to raise good kids, but to raise responsible Christian adults. And, you know, sometimes it takes tough love to do that. Um, when y'all started school, you know, I worked. And when you would get home from school, you were supposed to, you know, empty your lunch boxes so they'd be ready for me to fill with your lunch. That was before y'all started doing your own lunch. And you just kept not doing it, you know, you just put your lunch box on the thing. So one day I thought, well, I'm just not going to empty his stuff and I'm just going to leave the box like it is. 
And so the next day, you know, y'all went up to school. And I mean, it was hard. I knew you weren't going to have lunch when it came lunchtime. But I also knew that, you know, your teacher would probably give you some money for lunch, which she did. And I just paid her back. <laughs> she bailed me you know? out. But, I mean, you never forgot to empty your lunchbox again. So sometimes you just have to practice tough love. Yeah. Well, I think you've already preached my parenting sermon here on Mother's Day, Mom. You made a lot of good points there. I'm just kidding. Hey, is there one last thing you would say to encourage younger moms? Uh, form a friendship with another Christian mom um, that's trying to teach her kids the same things that you are. I think that's especially important for single moms. I mean, not that I know everything about being a single mom. I mean, you had you were fixing to start college. Kimberly had graduated from high he was fixing to be a senior in high school, you know, when your dad passed away, but Heather was starting middle high. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it was tough for both of us. She didn't have that other person to go to. I didn't have that other person to go to, but you know, you just have to pray a lot and ask God for wisdom. But I think for single moms, just having that other Christian mom, because I had a friend like that, you know, that something would come up with our kids They'd be invited to something at school or someone's house, and we talk about. We say, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sure that I want my kid to do this, or this is what I'm concerned about, mm -hmm. you know. And we would decide yes or no. And so, I mean, if we both said no, our kid can say, well, I'm going to be the only one not going, you know. So I think if younger moms could just have a good Christian friend, you know, maybe with kids the same age as theirs, it would really, you know, it would really help them. Yeah. Uh, and there's some things as a parent you need to have the final word on, uh, but you've got to pick your battles with your kids. You know, everything doesn't need to be a battle of the wheels. Okay. Sometimes just give them options, you know, and let, and let them choose. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, does it really matter that your son wants to wear this wild looking shorts and shirt to his kindergarten graduation, you know, instead of the nice shirt and pants you had picked out? No, what matters is that he walks up on that stage and he has a smile on his face. That's the mm -hmm. most important thing. So you do, you just have to pick your battles. Yeah. I guess the last thing, be just love your children unconditionally, just as God loves us. They're going to mess up. You're going to mess up as a parent, you know, but God still loves us and he forgives us. And as I said, just pray for them, you know, stay in God's word so you can continue to grow in your relationship with God. And that's going to help you be the best mom that you can be. And then by God's grace, in spite of the mistakes you make as a mom, you'll raise those Christian responsible adults. Because God has blessed me with three of them. Awesome. Well, I told you that the price of this interview was you could share an embarrassing story about me. And you talked about me wearing jams to my kindergarten graduation. So... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. For well, that. and that's right. Uh, let me uh, let me pray for you, Mom. Thank you for doing this. I love sure. you. Okay. Love you, Father. I, I just thank you for um, the chance to uh, talk with Mom today, and Lord, I thank you for uh, a Christian mom. I thank you that you you led her to understand, as a young mother, as an adult, uh, that she needed a personal relationship with Christ. And I thank you for uh, the influence that that had on on me and my sisters over the years. And, and I think about the nights that you could just like clockwork, go walk by her bedroom and see her having her quiet time, reading her Bible and connecting with you. And um, Father, I just thank you for the, the love and the influence that she has been in my life and pointing me toward Christ. And I pray you just continue to, to bless her and provide for her and reveal your faithfulness to her through each and every step and stage of life. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, Mom, thank you. Love you. All right, you're welcome. Love you. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. This next song reminds us that God is with us. He is for us, and he'll never leave us. And he'll never fail us. That our God is able. I hope you'll sing along. God is in.
praise to life our God is able in his name we overcome for the turn in your Bible to the book of Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs is kind of right in the middle of the Bible. If you open your Bible to the middle, you'll probably be in the book of Psalms. Proverbs comes right after that. And in Proverbs chapter 3 in verse 1, I want to talk to you today about wisdom for the home. And in verse 1, it says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom sayings. It's a collection of general truth statements that lead to a more God-honoring life. And the book of Proverbs has much to say about family relationships, particularly the relationship between parent and child. And I want us to see in this book today some truths for both, for both parents and children that will help us to fulfill God's purpose for our lives. Because many of these truths are sprinkled throughout the book of Proverbs, we'll be jumping around a bit. But let's begin by focusing on some principles for wise parenting in this book. The first thing that I want you to see for parents is that Proverbs teaches that wise parents provide instruction for their children. In chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, it says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching." For they are a graceful wreath about your head and pendants for your neck. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5 contains what Jesus called the greatest commandment. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And to love God and live for him with every fiber of our being is why we were created. And then the very next verses tell parents that it's our job to raise our kids to know and fulfill that purpose. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6, it says, These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The entire dynamic of the book of Proverbs is really built around the framework of a father providing instruction for his son about how to live a godly life. Chapter after chapter in this book contains explicit instructions from a parent to his son. We already saw in chapter 1 verse 8 how it says, Hear my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Chapter 2 verse 1, it says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, um, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Chapter 4, verse 1, Hear, O son, a father's instruction. Chapter 5, verse 1, My son, be attentive to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding. Chapter 6, verse 20, My son, keep your father's commandment and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Chapter 7, verse 1, my son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments within you. I think you get the picture. The entire fabric of this book is about parents instructing their children about how to live for God. And for moms and dads, we need this reminder that the primary responsibility for raising kids to know God and live by faith in Jesus is not given to the church, but to the home. The fact is that we as a church want to come alongside you as parents and equip you to disciple your children and even to provide ministries that will reinforce and strengthen what you're trying to do at home. But as we've especially seen in, in these past few weeks, the church can't do it all. Much of the responsibility lies with the family unit. And no church, no matter how dynamic and Christ-centered it is, can replace what God has designed a Christian home and family to do. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule. Praise God, there are examples of kids who grew up with terrible home lives and no Christian presence at home who came to know the Lord and, and did great things for God's kingdom. But those are the exception, not the norm. The general pattern is that our kids will not just drift toward holiness and Christ-likeness. If we want our kids to love and to follow God, We've got to be intentional about instructing them in God's word. That sounds like a daunting task, but even small intentional changes on our part can make great impact. Our daughter started taking piano this year, and we've tried to make it a part of the routine of our home that she takes just a few minutes a day to practice. Now, no single one of those practices by itself has made much of a difference, but the cumulative effect of five to 15 minutes a day has added up and she's made great strides in these past few months. Fortunately, we live in an era in which there's no shortage of resources available to assist parents in the task of discipling their kids. And many kids spend hours a day in front of screens, but no time at all with God's word. The time is there if we commit to being intentional about it. What would the cumulative effect be of reading one passage of scripture a day with our kids or taking five to 15 minutes to do a devotion together as a family? What could God do in our home if we were meditating on and memorizing a verse of scripture each week or a couple of verses a month? This is easy enough to do when our kids are young. It can be tougher to do as they get older, but it can be done. 
Maybe you come up with a, a reward and you say, you know, if, if we do our devotion this week without complaining, we'll order pizza Friday night. Or if your kids are competitive, make it a challenge. Say, you know, hey, let's see who can be the first one in the family to memorize this week's verse. And the winner gets to pick what's for dessert. From those examples, you can probably tell that food is a motivator in our house. Maybe it's something different to motivate your kids. But the point is, whether or not we have kids at home, we have a calling to be intentional about instructing our own hearts in God's truth. Wise parents also, secondly, model godly behavior. Wise parents model godly behavior. Proverbs 20 verse 7 says, The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Proverbs 31 talks about all the ways a godly wife and mother will lead her family by living out her faith in practical ways. And the point of these passages is that just instructing our kids in God's truth is not enough. We've got to lead by example and show them what it looks like to follow the Lord. Do as I say, not as I do, is not the motto of godly parenting. Instead, parents ought to model for their children the principles that they are trying to instill in them. Every Christian ought to strive to say to those around them what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that's doubly true for parents. Thirdly, wise parents dis discipline their children. There are a large number of verses in the book of Proverbs that address the issue of discipline. Many speak about the rod of discipline. And there's a good bit of debate over whether that term means literally spanking our children or whether the rod refers more to just the principle that parents must have a system of discipline in place. I do agree with those who have noted that spanking in our culture is often just a way for parents to give vent to their own anger and frustration. And that's not helpful. A biblical view of corporal punishment is one in which the parent is in control of himself. Attempting to use that form of punishment is a way to firmly and lovingly correct their child, not just take their anger out on them. Sometimes a spanking might be the most effective way to discipline. Other times letting the child face the consequence of their actions might be more appropriate, like when my mom sent me to school with an empty lunchbox. But whether you choose to spank or not, what's clear in the Bible is that parents must correct and reprove their children when they sin. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Anyone who has encountered a grown child who's never been told no or, has been, or never been made to face the consequences of their actions knows that it's not love in the long run to let a child live without discipline. Therefore, Proverbs 19, verse 18 says, Discipline your son while there is hope, and do not desire his death. In other words, the parent who refuses to discipline their child is actually putting them on a path that leads to death. But the way to demonstrate you have hope for your child is by holding them accountable for their actions. And so Proverbs 29, 17 says, Correct your son, and he will give you comfort. He will also delight your soul. And if we do these things, God's word to parents is found in Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Again, that's a general truth statement, not a hard and fast promise. There are exceptions to every rule, but generally, when parents are faithful to intentionally teach their children the gospel and to model a consistent Christian lifestyle, and to prayerfully discipline their children, the result is they raise adults who grow up to continue on the path their parents showed them as a child. So that's wisdom for parents. Now let's turn to wisdom for children. Now we're all children in a sense, but I think the truths we're going to see here apply to those of us who have parents still living, and especially apply to those of us who still live at home and are dependent upon our parents. And the first thing I want you to see in the book of Proverbs for children is that wise children obey their parents' teaching. We generally don't know what we haven't been taught. And so God gives us uh, 
parent, gives children parents to teach them all the things that they don't know. Have you ever noticed how many questions a young child asks? One study of kids aged 2 to 10 years old found that the average mother asked, is, is asked almost 300 questions a day by her children. The highest age group was four-year-old little girls. We have one at our house right now, and they average nearly 400 questions per day. Some of you have three to four children right now in that age range in your home. That's a thousand questions or more a day. And the reason that kids ask so many questions is that they don't know much. It's how they learn. And so the younger you are, the more you need the instruction your parents provide. But the truth is, no matter how old or smart you are, your parents will always have something to teach you. Proverbs 23, 22 says, Listen to your father who begot you, and do not despise your mother when she is old. I'm nearly 40, and I have more degrees than my mom, but I still call and ask her advice regularly. Listen to your parents, and you'll save yourself a world of heartache. Secondly, the book of Proverbs teaches that wise children receive discipline with maturity. Proverbs 15 verse 5 says, A fool rejects his father's discipline, but he who regards reproof is sensible. Now, no child likes to be disciplined or punished, but one mark of wisdom and maturity is that we learn to accept loving correction and constructive criticism. I tell our youth at church from time to time, that if you want to show your parents that you're mature, then admit when you're wrong and receive their discipline without a fight. If you want them to give you more freedom, show that you can live within the rules and boundaries that they've set for you. Wise children understand those limits and boundaries are probably there for a good reason, even if they don't understand or agree with them at the moment. And so Proverbs 3 verse 11 and 12 says, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. The reality is you will have limits and authority all of your life, kids. Learn to live under your parents' authority is part of the way, for, uh, part of God's way of showing you how to live under his authority too. Thirdly, wise children treat their parents with respect. It may seem cool to roll your eyes at your parents or back talk them or mutter under your breath as you walk away or to make fun of your parents behind their back. But the Bible has some pretty strong words for those who disrespect their parents. Proverbs 19.26 says, He who assaults his father and drives his mother away is a shameful and disgraceful son. Proverbs 30 verse 17 says, The eye that mocks a father and scorns a mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out and the young eagles will eat it. That's kind of gross. But the reality is, when we choose to disrespect our parents, we're disrespecting God because we're despising an authority that God has placed in our lives for our good. One of the Ten Commandments is to honor our father and our mother. And no, our parents are not always perfect or honorable, but neither are we. When we choose to treat them with kindness and respect, even if it seems they don't deserve it, we are at the very least showing honor to God. Now, that's the book of Proverbs vision for being a wise parent and a wise child. But that kind of leaves something out, doesn't it? After all, it's, it's possible to see all these things as just a roadmap to living a good moral life. And as long as we check off all these boxes and keep a respectful attitude toward our parents, and as long as a parent that I don't lose it on my kids and, and set a bad example for them, then that's enough. But it's not really enough. Remember the great commandment? We're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, and strength. That's not just outward conformity to a set of rules. That's inward desire. And if we're honest, none of us, parents or children, lives up to that standard. Many times we want to do the right things, but we find ourselves unable to live up to being the parent or child that we know we should be. Other times we, we find outwardly conforming 
to what it means to be a good person, easy. But on the inside, we're kicking and screaming against it all the way. And our hearts are in a different place. We need a heart change. We need a new spirit. And that's why Jesus came. He's the perfectly obedient son who always obeyed his heavenly father with all of his heart, soul, and strength. He never sinned. And yet, the one who never deserved to be punished or corrected by his father submitted himself to the worst punishment ever, death on a cross, all so that you and I could be set free from our sin and be called children of God. And he rose again from the dead that we could share in the new life that he gives when we trust him by faith. And like my mom shared earlier, being a Christian isn't just trying to live a good moral life. It's a total surrender to Jesus Christ and allowing him to transform us from the inside out. The irony is we've got to admit that we can't be the parent or child we know we should be before we really begin to fulfill God's purpose for our life. But once we humble ourselves and admit our need and our inability to God, it frees us from the burden of trying to be the perfect parent or the perfect kid and allows us to give and receive grace. We can freely own our mistakes to our families. And the language and the atmosphere of grace begins to transform our lives and our homes. Words like, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I was wrong, I forgive you, come much easier. And though the battle to spend time in God's word and submit to his discipline may always be a struggle, there will be a greater desire to fight for holiness than ever before. Every parent needs Jesus. Every child needs Jesus. And the way to start living wisely as a parent or a child today is to begin building your life and your home on Jesus Christ. Proverbs 14, 26 says, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. You want to change your home? Then put your hope and confidence in God. Worship him, pursue him, and guess what? He won't just change your life, mom and dad, but as you follow Jesus and lead your kids to do the same, he'll become their refuge too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wisdom that it gives us for all of life and even for, for our life at home. Father, I know during this time when uh, we're all kind of isolating and, and probably spending more time at home with our families. Maybe there's been more tension, more disagreements, more frustration. Father, I pray that we would pursue your path of wisdom today, that as parents, that we would instruct our kids in God's word, that we would model a godly, consistent Christian witness for them, that we'd be faithful to give discipline and correction when needed. Father, I pray for kids that they would receive the instruction of their parents. They would receive discipline with maturity. They would honor and respect their parents. And Father, I pray for all of us that we would set our hope on Jesus Christ, that you would be our refuge and our strength, that we would understand our need for your grace and your forgiveness. And that as we receive your forgiveness from our sin, that you would empower us to give grace and show grace to those around us, especially those who live within the, the walls of our home together with us, who see us at our worst. Father, help us to give them our best and to show them your love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.